Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes you just need to come in with some worship. You need to remind yourself of who God is, his sovereignty, his power. Sometimes you just need to humble yourself and know that it's not you, but it's always God. That God goes before you to make your way perfect. That God defines you, defines your gift, defines your calling. Sometimes you just got to pause for a minute and let God be God. So I'm grateful this morning and I thank God because I know him. And that's a declaration in itself that I know God. And I'm grateful for a relationship with God, a sovereign God, a good God. I thank God for our pastor, Pastor Malobi, in his absence, and I'm grateful to have a shepherd who cares about the sheep that he's been given. And I'm grateful for a pastor who's able to speak life into you, even when you're like, I don't know, I can't, I don't think so. Pastor's not one to accept excuses, and I'm grateful for that because it means that he's been empowered by God to push us to be closer to God. So I'm grateful this morning to be before you in this capacity. It's been a minute. I feel like the last time I've been up here, I was probably pregnant at one point. Um, Not this time. We're clear. Um, But I'm grateful to God that he still calls people and that his gifts are without repentance. They don't change. And I'm grateful for all of you. Grateful to be able to be before you. Grateful to see your faces. Grateful to encounter God and journey with you guys in knowing who God is. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 9. You might do a little bit of journeying today, but we're used to it, right? Luke chapter 9. And we're going to start at verse 10. Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 10. Is everyone all right? Feeling good? Been participating in the worship? Feeling God move on your heart? All right. Let's continue encountering God and his word. If you have the word, just shout, I have the word. word. All right. Verse 10 begins. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place. Someone say deserted place. Belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him. And he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who need of healing or had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions. For we are in a deserted place here. Someone shout deserted place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. And 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. This is the word of the Lord. So if I had to give a topic, we'll see if we stick to it, if God allows us to stick to it. But if I had to give a topic, it would be called filled in a deserted place. Filled in a deserted place. When we get to Luke's chapter 9, Jesus has just sent out earlier in the chapter, he's just sent out the disciples to preach the kingdom of God with power and authority and to heal those who are sick. And that's interesting because Pastor last week was talking about the shift, right? There, there being a shift in our lives and how God en- empowers us to be able to soar within the shift. And here we come upon a shifting chapter where the disciples are called together and they're being um, equipped by God with power and with authority to go forward and to essentially change every atmosphere that they're in. Now, this is important for us to note before we continue because we have to remember 
that the disciples were ordinary men. Ordinary men who were fishermen for the most part. Some of them, Matthew was a tax collector, but for the most part, they were fishermen. And they already had a task before him, before them. So when Jesus calls them out of where they were, they're now having to take on a new edifice, a new title. Being a learner of Jesus and learning more about who Jesus is. But here in chapter 9, Jesus does something interesting in calling them and sending them out. They're no longer disciples. They become apostles. And they're given power and authority. And when I read that, I was like, wow, I wonder why they needed power and authority. And then I thought about the fact that we have an adversary. We have an enemy. We can't just go into atmospheres, into environments that are rugged with with different things, with sinful things, with evil things, and think that our word is going to be enough to change something. So Jesus goes and gives them a task and gives them a call, but he doesn't do it just alone with the call. He says, here's some power and authority. So that way when you go into a circumstance or you go into a situation or you go into an environment, you step in with the power of God working through you, and now you're able to speak to things and things change. And they don't change momentarily. They change eternally. They change definitely That's the beauty of the power of God. That's the beauty of the authority that God gives us. That when we go into spaces, we're not going in them for temporary change. We're going into them so that things can change definitively. They can change indefinitely. They don't have to revert back. And that's our task as believers. That once we become filled with the Holy Spirit, once we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, was raised from the dead with all power in his might, and we take on that mantle, that shifting name of Christian, when we go, when we are sent out in our calling, we're able to operate with both power and authority. We're no longer victim to our circumstance. We're no longer victim to the things that may have defined us once before. We're now able to stand in God's power and God's authority. So the disciples are able to now move and be sent out because they've received something greater than what they had. They have power and authority over all demons. Luke chapter 9 verse 1 says, all demons, not some, not one, not two, all of them. Now that's a lot of power. That's a lot of authority. Imagine you walk into the church, you're just like, whoosh, all them demons are off the pew. Now, now that's something to shout about, right? But why can't we desire that? Why do we desire to come in and leave the same way? If we were able to look at someone and hear the voice of God say, pray for this person, for this thing, speak to this thing, and things shift in that person's life, don't you think the gospel would go further and further and further, quicker? Power and authority. Can't operate with power and not have authority. Imagine a king coming in and sitting down and not being able to make things happen, but he's supposed to be a king. That doesn't make sense. Power and authority. And as a Christian believer, we have to be reminded of that, that we have power. Someone say power. And we have authority. Someone say authority. Receive that. Power and authority. And he sends them out to be able to um, have authority and power over all the demons and to cure diseases. Now, this is important because it showcases that Jesus was saying, I need you to be able to do a spiritual work and a natural work. I need you to be able to go in and change the spiritual atmosphere, but also remind people that God sees them in their natural ailments and is able to deliver them from that. So, Let's think through the context of this. In the, first century, uh, in the first century where Jesus is operating in, when you had certain diseases, according to Jewish law, you would be excommunicated, ostracized, you'd be put to the side, you'd be asked to leave the area, the community, you'd be looked down upon, you'd have to do all of these rituals and things to be able to be clean. And so the fact that Jesus is equipping them, rather equipping them, to be able to go forward in power and authority, he's saying, go forward and change their spiritual lives, that they know that they have a Savior, that the kingdom of God is now at hand, but also that they don't have to live on the outskirts of society anymore, that they can come back in because now they've been cured and saved and set free. Deliverance is a powerful thing, y'all. Imagine seeing someone who had cancer come back and say, I have no more cancer. 
We have some of those testimonies here, right? Imagine someone coming in and saying, well, I didn't have a limb, but now God grew out my whole arm or grew out my leg or grew out my foot. Imagine coming in and seeing that. But I, the, the thing that would come to me was, I, I, I remember when you didn't have this, though. I remember when you didn't have this or you looked like this or you were experiencing this. And the beauty of the power and authority of God is that it changes the narrative. It shifts the narrative where it's no longer what you used to be. But it's now who you are in God. And that's why God gives them power and authority. So that they're able to speak to a spiritual shift and a natural shift. To be able to illustrate the power of the kingdom of God. There's no sickness in the kingdom of God. There's no pain in the kingdom of God. How can I preach a kingdom of God and you still stay the same? Power and authority. I have to be able to preach the kingdom and I need you to be able to experience the kingdom. That's what transformation becomes, of being, being able to receive the spiritual work and also seeing the natural manifestation of the spiritual work. Power and authority. So they preach the kingdom of God. They go forward and heal the sick, and they're actually able to do it, right? They're actually able to do it, and we know that to be so because when we get to verse 10 in Luke chapter 9, we're told that they are returning back to Jesus and that they're telling him all that they have done. Now, I'm sure they were tired from exercising demons, healing people. They probably needed a little bit of a reset. And so when they get to Jesus, Jesus takes them and goes privately into a deserted place in the city called Bethsaida. I think this is so amazing of God. It's so caring of God to say, look, I know you've been working, but here's some rest. I know you've been giving yourself and you've been obeying the call and you've been obeying what I've told you to do. Here's a moment to relax with me, right? But also what's interesting is that in this moment of privately going somewhere, the work that has been done by Jesus, the work that has been done by the apostles, it precedes them where there's really no place for them to rest because now the multitudes come and follow them where they are. And when you're operating in the power and authority of God, you're going to draw an audience that's attached to your calling, that's attached to your work. And often we don't think like that because I know for me, I may have paused in my thought around my calling because I was so afraid of messing up or not being the right representation or doing things incorrectly or am I enough? Do I have this training? Can All these questions. And God's like, I don't need you to answer any of those. When we look at Luke chapter 9, it doesn't say that they had to run through all these qualifications. They just had to be with him. And they received power and authority. And that doesn't stop them from going forward and being sent out. And so for this chapter here, we're seeing that God is saying, it's not about what you think you can do. It's not about your qualifications. It's not about your placements and where's the best place. And, oh, I did this so I don't qualify. God is like, I don't care about what the world says as qualifications. You are qualified because I give you power and authority, power to change, power to think differently, power to heal, power to speak the word and things happen, power to communicate with other people, power to connect with other people, power to travel and to do great things in my name. Preach the kingdom of God, not your pedigree, not your resume, not all the Greek and Hebrew that you think you may know. Don't preach all of that. Preach the kingdom of of God with power and authority. And that will do the work. The word of God does the work. So the multitudes, they follow. They hear that the, the apostles are there. They hear that Jesus is there. And now Jesus is the main man because he, he comes in and he's turning the world that they know upside down. Everything about him is anti what they know. So he's coming in and he's preaching against the Pharisees. He's convicting them. He's calling things out. He's saying that the spirit of the Lord is upon him, right? Like he's able to move in this, this new operation that wasn't done before. And so when they hear that, but also when they see the transformation, when they see the transformation, they're able to now desire that change for themselves. So the multitudes hear it. And Jesus, even though there's supposed to be this moment of rest, he receives them. 
He speaks to them about the kingdom of God. And he heals those who are in need of healing. And that's powerful, too, because it says that Jesus is able and willing to do the very thing that he's called the apostles to do. He tells the apostles that they need to go forward and preach the kingdom of God, that they have to go forward with power and authority and heal the sick. And here he is demonstrating the very thing he's asked them to do. And so that reminder is for us that when God gives us a work to do, when he tells us to go forward with power and authority, he's not telling us to do something that he himself is not able to do. Hence why he gives you and equips you with gifts. He equips you with power. He equips you with the ability to do things because he's able to do it through you. It's not about you doing it. It's him doing it through you. So they go. These people come. God is preaching. He's healing. Things are happening. And then the day begins to go down. It's kind of like when we're here and it hits like a strong 2.30 and we're like, so is it time for us to go now or are we doing communion or no? Like, what are we doing? But that's how our minds go. Like, okay, we've been here since 9 o'clock. It's 2.31. I got to go. And the disciples have that same mentality because they're like, we're supposed to be resting. We done worked. We done did a thing. The day is wearing Jesus. <laughs> And I thought that was interesting because it doesn't say the people thought that. People weren't like, I got to go, because they were getting healed. Lives lives are being changed. It was the disciples, rather the apostles at this point, who were like, the day is wearing. Don't y'all want to go home? You know how people overstay their welcome? And you're like, "Mm, it's 9 o'clock. You just start clearing out the the dishes, taking the cups. You done with this? Yeah. That's what was happening here. It's time for them to go because they're hungry. Now, no one said they were hungry. No one records this. And I think what's interesting is that this particular miracle is in all four Gospels. So I was doing this parallel study of all of the stories. And in all of the stories, no one says anything but the disciples. Which is interesting. I'm going to take that conviction point for what it is. But you know how church folk can be. Okay, pastor, we got to go. But if God is doing a work... That's the difference. If God is doing a work, if he's delivering people and changing people's lives, how dare we rush them out? If they're receiving a word that's changing their lives, it may not be for you. That's okay. That may not be your opportunity right now. That's okay because God is doing a work in the midst. And sometimes just being in the midst is enough of a witness. Because if God is able to do it in one person's life over here, someone over there can get healed too. Someone in the back can see that and now be transformed. Someone in the back can pray a different prayer. Someone in the front, it just becomes this this springboard effect. Just being in the midst. Not rushing past what is happening for the sake of your own agenda. Imagine if someone came and was like, "Mm, it's time for me to go. And Jesus was just down their pew, just down their aisle, right? Missed their opportunity for everlasting change. Just because we're in a rush. And I take that conviction because this morning, I had a morning, y'all. I had a morning. I am a mom of two, if you guys don't already know. So, you know, I'm always going to bring up my children now because they're my world. Um, But it's interesting being a mom of two because the world doesn't stop for them. They don't care that I'm a minister, I got a career, I got a husband. They don't care about none of that. They're like, we're hungry. Like, my son will come up to me and be like, eat, eat, water, water. He signs, too. So he's like, water, water. And it's like, I just need to get this scripture out, but I got to go and tend to him. Um, And Noah just looks up at me, and then he just starts crying. Like, he's like, woman, you know you're the milk supply. What's going on? (laughs) Um, But it's interesting because in that I found myself, you know, this was a a struggle for me. Fast, if you're watching this, this was a stretch. Um, It was a stretch for me because when I was first called to preach, I was single, and it was just me. And I was like, not... I wasn't even feeling like I was qualified to be, to be a preacher at all. And I still sometimes battle that, but we're working past it. We're praying past it. Um, but what was powerful for me now when I thought about it, this is my first time preaching as a mom of two, like two under two. And I felt the, the tuggle, the tuggle, the, the struggle. <laughs> mom of two here. The struggle 
between my calling and my children and trying to put together a sermon and trying to hear God and trying to do all of these things and realizing that what was for one season doesn't fit this season. So where I would have time to sit down and do all this Greek and Hebrew analysis and, you know, get up when I wanted to and go here and then look at this, I really had to pray so much more this time around. Like, God, I don't got it. I don't, I don't, I, I can't hear you because I'm hearing Miss Rachel in Sesame Street. I can't hear you right now. Um, and I was like, God, I just need you to honor the desire to hear. Just honor the desire to to, to preach a word that you give, not that I give. And I feel like God had to remind me similarly to this, this passage that his timing is not my timing. And his equipping is not my equipping. You know, it doesn't matter how many definitions I get. If I don't have God's power and God's authority, then I'm always going to be relegated to my own strength and my own energy. But if I depend on God, when God is moving, if I'm in the midst where God is doing a thing, if I'm able to be present where God is speaking, then lives can still be changed because he's doing the work, no matter my energy capacity. And I was grateful for that reminder because it humbled me. It humbled me because it, it, it means that I'm not alone in this thing. Sometimes when we get a calling or things shift in our lives or we're in a season, we can feel so depleted and we can feel so isolated and feel like no one understands, no one sees, no one can, can relegate or rather, rather resonate with what you're going through. And God reminds us here that even though the disciples were tired, even though they had just done a lot of work, even though their season shifted from being a disciple who was just learning to now being an equipped apostle who was now doing the work, even though those shifts were happening, that it doesn't stop. The work doesn't stop because God doesn't stop. So the dependency is not on me and my own strength, but now the dependency has to be on God because seasons do change. Things do shift. I'm going to be a mom of two plus forever, right? That's not going to change. So I have to now change my prayer. I have to change my approach to God. It can't be the same approach. It can't be the same designated time. And I think where the disappointment comes for me, so I like control over my time. Anyone can, re you know, re relate to that? You like being able to get up and say, hmm, I'm going to get up and do this, or I'm going to go and do that. And having children, that's a big no. Even having a husband, that's a no, but I love you, Aaron. But it's uh, still a no, because you're just kind of in relationship with someone else. But that's my point. When you're in relationship with someone else, then you're not just relegated to your own time, to your own resources. And when we're in relationship with God, truly, then we're not relegated to our own emotions and to our own thoughts and to our own desires and our own plans. God has a greater timeline for us. So instead of being angry and disappointed that we can't do what we want to do, how about we're grateful that God has a plan that we don't have to orchestrate ourselves? God is good like that. He's good like that. And he's powerful enough to execute the plan if we're willing, if we're desiring to. Let him do that. So when the day began to wear away, the disciples are like, all right, time to go. They need to eat. For there's nothing here for them to eat, this deserted place. But Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. You do the work. You have something that you can give. And that's powerful because the disciples felt like they didn't have anything to give to these people. They're like, I, my pockets are empty, Jesus. You told us to take nothing with us when we went out. So I don't have anything. Um, and they got relegated to this deserted place. Deserted places. Often, when we're in a shifting season, we can feel, like I said, isolated and alone. And sometimes we can feel deserted. Does anyone know what deserted means? Just raise your hand if you're aware. Have, has anyone been in a deserted place before? Yeah. It feels lonely. It feels dark. It feels sorrowful. It feels like you're on a slow stance, like you're not going anywhere. 
And sometimes I know for me, when I've been in a deserted place, whether that's a deserted place of anxiety, a deserted place of depression, a deserted place of failure, a deserted place of sorrow or hurt or pain or trauma, you can fill in the blank with your deserted place. But when I've been there, I've often asked the question of God, are you even here with me? You know what I mean? Where you're just sitting there in that spot and you're just like, God, I don't know if you're here. Because if you're here, things are supposed to be different. You know how we have this, men this mentality of like, if A plus B equals C, and we're just seeing B, where's the A? Where's the C? Where are the things, God? Where, where are the miracles Gideon asked, right? Like, if we're in a deserted place and, God, you're supposed to be with me in my highs and my lows, God, where are you? Because I don't see you moving the way I wanted you to move. And that's the issue right there. We don't see God moving the way we want him to move. And God is saying, I never told you I was moving like that in the first place. Additionally, you're not even seeking to hear me because you spend all your prayer time talking instead of listening, right? God is like, well, if you knew that I'm God, you know that I'm sovereign, you know I don't change, you know that I'm good, I, I have innate goodness in me. God is not cruel. God is not evil where he, he, he's joyful in our torment. That's not God. God is not happy when we are in a trial necessarily. He's happy about the results. But the test, God is like, I'm walking alongside you. I'm empowering you to endure because I know this is hard. God is not ignorant to our needs. He's not ignorant to our loneliness. He's not ignorant to our lack of strength. He's not ignorant to our tiredness. You know what? God is not ignorant to our questions. There's so many times in the gospel where God would hear their hearts and he'd be moved to respond based on what their heart's intent was saying. Do you know how powerful of a God you have to be to hear the heart of somebody and they're not saying a word? That's the God we serve. When we're in deserted places and we feel like things are not working out the way they need to or things aren't working out the way that we want them to, we have to remind ourselves about the goodness of God. That God is good, that his mercy does endure forever, that his truth is without end. Because the first thing the enemy wants to attack is our knowledge of who God is. I know that to be true personally. When I've gone through tests or gone through trials or gone through stretching, the first thing I usually do is I begin to wrestle with, well, God, if you're with me and for me, why is, what's going on here? Why is this circumstance picking up in my life? Why, why is this unforgiveness coming back up in my heart? Why, why, why is this issue with this, with this situation coming back up? God, wh what are you doing? I thought you were for me. But it rains on the just and the unjust. And just because it may look like there's something good for someone else does not negate God's goodness in our lives. That's where gratitude comes in. Where God's saying, well, look at all the things I've done already. I've healed you. I've saved you. I've loved you. I've provided for you. I've hugged you and comforted you. I've made opportunities open for you. I put your name in rooms you weren't even in so that when you got to the room, you were able to access the opportunity. I've given you family when you had no family. I've given you friends when you had no friends. I put money in your pocket, food on your table. I am good towards you. in a deserted place? Can you be grateful in a deserted place? Can you be whole in a deserted place? Can you push toward God in a deserted place, in an unknown place, in a questioning place? Can you get to God where you are? Send them away, the disciples say, for we are in a deserted place. And interestingly enough, in John's gospel of this account that we read earlier, Jesus poses the question to Philip. He says, well, what are these people going to eat? But John writes that Jesus asked Philip the question because he already knew what he was going to do. He already knew. Hallelujah. 
I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that God already knows. He already knows what you have need of. He already knows what you need prayer for. He already knows what your circumstance is. He already knows what your issue is. Sometimes he puts us in places for questioning so we can realize who he is. If he didn't ask Philip, they wouldn't have even realized that what needed to happen was going to be a miracle. Do you understand what I'm saying? That if he hadn't asked Philip, well, what are you going to do with these people? They need to eat that he wouldn't have even been able to have a mindset, Philip. He wouldn't have had a mindset to even realize, wait a minute, these people need to eat and this is impossible. It's impossible for me to feed them. It's impossible for the disciples to feed feed these people. We're going to need a miracle. Jesus is like, fantastic. That's why I'm here. He says to them in Luke's account, You give them something to eat as if they have something already. And that's the beauty of God already knowing us. That he already knows what we are in need of, but he also knows what we have. We are not a church that doesn't have anything. Do you believe that for yourself? Okay, you may be in a deserted place, but you're alive. You have the word. You have a life group, you have a pastor, you have ministers, you have people. You also have access to healing. You have access to deliverance. You have access to the Holy Spirit who can empower you. You have access to wisdom. The word says in James that if you ask God for wisdom, he'll give it to you liberally. You can get as much wisdom as you want. There's so much that you can get no matter where your position is. Even in a deserted place. You have something to give. You have something that you can give to other people, even if it doesn't look like much. Sometimes I wonder, sometimes it pains me when I see people on the street who are hungry or or dealing with drug addiction. I think part of that is coming from my own like family structure of dealing with family members who have dealt with drug addiction and seeing the effects of that firsthand growing up. So when I see people in the street who are dealing with drug addiction or who are homeless, my heart pains for them because I wish I could just feed them, like, right then and there. I wish I could just go and just get them food. I wish I could set them up in a house. You know, like, when you go to the hospital and you're like, I wish I could just whoosh over everybody and they just get up? That's my desire because I just, I think my heart just goes toward I don't want people to experience that type of pain or that disconnection. Not really knowing their story, but just wishing and hoping that they would be able to be restored and be whole. And when it comes to God, he's able to do that through us, even with our prayer, but even more so being able to redirect people here, right? So when we think about, oh, God, I don't have anything to give, God is like, well, you have a church, You have a church family that's doing great work. Even if you're not there at Lord's Kitchen, you can sow into the the ministry that the missionaries are doing. You can come and give your time. You can be present when things are happening. Be here for 5 a.m. prayer. Walk around the community. There's so much that you can give. But we don't have to think so limitedly about what we're giving. Because God doesn't look at us and say, oh, you have nothing. God is saying, no, you have something you can give them. Even if it's me. Even if it's the gospel, even if it's the word, you have something that can give them. Even reminding them, like Mother Ramos used to do, that they are loved by God. You give them something to eat, something for them to sustain on. So they look, the disciples, and they say, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. And what's interesting about this is that in John's account, when he poses the question to Philip, that um, Andrew comes and he's like, well, actually, there's this child here. So they get these five loaves and these two fish from a child in John 6. And I thought that was really great because it shows the emphasis on including our youth. Like the fact that our youth are able to give something that can now be used by Jesus for a miracle. He doesn't ask an adult to go fish. He doesn't send the disciples to go to the market. He sets it up that a child that's along the crowd, I don't know where the child comes from, but the child that's along with the crowd has something to offer to the miracle. Are you looking around at our youth and saying you have something to offer to our church? 
You have something to offer to our, our community. You have something to offer to just other youth around. Do we even take notice of them around our church anymore? Something that we have to give them to eat. Our youth have something to offer. You have something to offer. And it's important that we remind ourselves that we are not in a church of destitution, that we're in a church of plenty. There's so many testimonies here of people getting jobs and people getting raises and people getting opportunities, people getting random money out of nowhere, loans being forgiven. I don't think you understand. This doesn't happen regularly. There are people literally dying of poverty and hunger all around the world. There are people that are war-stricken right now in the Middle East and in Africa and all around the world. And there are people that are in this church who are not experiencing any of that. And even in our deserted places, we still have a testimony. God is good. So when Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat, he is reminding them that there's a resource here. They look and they see the five loaves and the two fish, and they're like, "Mm, maybe we can go and buy food. Maybe we could. And Jesus says, you know what? Make them sit down in groups of 50. I love this. I love this. God is a God of order. God is a God of order and system. The reason why I say that is because Jesus could have said, all right, um, give them them what you got and let them go, right? Doesn't seem like an intentional God would do that. So we see God's attribute and his character here because he's saying, you take authority of the space And you make them sit down, and you make them get into this number. Now, remember, there's over 5,000 people here. There's only 5,000 men. They didn't record women and children. And so there may be well over 15,000, 20,000 people along this mountainside or this deserted area. There's nothing here but these people, Jesus, and the apostles. And that's sometimes all that you need because Jesus is here in the midst instituting order. How many people need order in their lives? Make them sit down in groups of 50. The power and the authority that God gave them in Luke chapter 9 verse 1 is still able to be utilized here in this verse. Where he's saying in the midst of chaos, in the midst of questions and rumblings and groanings, you put some order there. You make things different. You put a structure. You arrange them where they can be in a place to receive from me. You do it. And sometimes we have a spiritual arrogance where we believe that God is supposed to just do all these things and we're not in a position to receive what he's supposed to do. And I feel like God is so much loving and kind towards us that he's like, you know what? I'm going to put some grace here and I'm going to rearrange it. But sometimes we can become so spiritually arrogant in ourselves that we think that God's supposed to do things because we ask for it. And God is like, no, put some order in place. Get your business together. If you don't know how, ask me how. So that way I can tell you what the next step is so you can be in a place to receive the great things I have for you. Sit down. Get in order. Get in line with the word of God. Read your word daily. How many people are reading you version? Okay, hands are going up. Love it. Get in the word daily. Get prayer into your life daily. That's how you get in order. Get in your life group. If you don't know what your life group is or who your life group is supposed to be about, ask anybody. We're all able to be a resource. But the the time of sitting in disorder and dysfunction is no longer. God doesn't want that for us. And if we're to be a church of productivity and a church of prosper life and abundant life, well, we need to be in order to receive that. We need order. That's a kingdom principle. Before God could even do anything in Genesis 1, the word says that the spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. God had to get over and hover over the chaos, over the darkness, over the issues, over the things that weren't defined to then make definition out of the chaos. Then he starts rhythmically each verse making something and instituting something and then pronouncing a good word over it and saying that it's good. God is a God of order. 
even before he delivers the Israelites in Exodus, he's able to raise up a deliverer in Moses by having the midwives be able to now deliver this male child who was actually supposed to be killed. He set up the order that now Moses was able to be able, was able to be a deliverer. He was able to rise up. He was able to be saved to now deliver these people who have been in bondage for over 400 years. Order. Before Jesus comes to the earth in the Gospels, he has a predecessor in John the Baptist who's able to preach the kingdom of God and repentance. Jesus just couldn't come. When you have a king, you always set up the table for them to come. You always set up the atmosphere for them to be there. Order. Someone shout order. Order. God desires for us to be in order. So he tells the disciples, you get them in order. And the time of us rising as leaders is now that we will be able to look at our congregation and our members and those in our life group and be able to encourage each other to be in order with God. We don't have to stay in dysfunction. There's deliverance. There's freedom. There's power. There's love. There's forgiveness available. But you have to get in order. That's a word for us. That's a word for me. God, help me. Help us to get in order. Jesus, order our thoughts, God. Order our minds, God. Order our hearts, God. In your word, oh God. Order. Hallelujah. Order. And I love that God calls us to an ordered place. He calls us to a higher place than our dysfunction and our chaos and our questions and our pains and our trauma. He acknowledges the reality of those things and sends us a Savior who's able to deliver us out of those things. Order. What a great God we serve. So the disciples make these thousands of people into groups of 50, and they all sit down, which is astonishing because I have two little ones, and telling, no, telling three to sit down is like impossible. So having children, women, and men all sitting down, the power and authority of God. So Jesus then takes the five loaves and the two fish. He raises them up. He looks up to heaven. He blesses them, and he breaks them and gives them to the disciples to set before the multitude. What's powerful about this particular verse is the parallel that I see between this and communion. In order for Jesus to be able to give of himself, he had to be broken. He had to be made to be able to be distributed. And the fact that God desired to do that for us is so astonishing to me. That in this verse, we see him setting up this supper table, if you will, and instituting, in some ways, this look back to who God has called him to be in terms of being able to look up to the heaven and see a miraculous work happen. He looks up, blesses the food, breaks it, and gives it to the disciples to set before the multitude. Amazing things that God is doing because in order for the bread to be broken— Jesus had to lift it up, and in order for it to be distributed, he had to be able to distribute it first to the disciples. Can God give you something to give to someone else? Can God give you something to give to someone else? Can he give you himself, which he does in his word, to give to someone else? Can you carry it? Can you hold it? Can you give it to someone else? The disciples did. And it said that they all ate and were filled. Twelve baskets of leftover fragments. Now let's be clear. Five loaves. Two fish. That's really giving maybe two plates and a possible. And now you have twelve baskets left over. And what's powerful for this particular verse is the fact that the number twelve represents divine order. Let's catch it. Divine order is the number 12. It means government. It means like divine government. Like it means God setting the standard of power and authority. 
So the fact that there's surplus is a hearkening back to the kingdom of God because it's saying that in the kingdom of God, that God the kingdom of God that they wanted uh, to be preached and to be demonstrated, that there's a filling and then there's surplus. Filling and surplus. So if we're called to be Christians within this kingdom walk, within this kingdom atmosphere, then we must first be filled and then there has to be overflow. There has to be surplus. And now remind ourselves that all of this is taking place in a deserted area, a deserted town, a deserted place, that all of this surplus is happening where just a few verses ago, the disciples were telling them to go away, telling Jesus that maybe these people should go and seek after something somewhere else. And Jesus is saying here, no, I'm able to take what's deserted and what's decrepit and what's low and what's unheard and unnumbered. I'm able to take that and make sure that I fill and that there's overflow. And I don't know about you, but I need a fill and I need overflow. I need a filling for God to give his word and and have it implanted in my heart. I need a filling of strength. I need a filling of love and forgiveness. I need a filling of power. I need a filling. So that way when I'm able to be filled, it's not just for me, but that there's something left over. There's something to be given out later. Often we find ourselves in a place in a need for, for a rebuild or a reset because we're not filled properly. The things that we're eating and taking in, whether it's physically, y'all know what y'all have on your plates, whether it's physically or whether it's spiritually, the things we take in, whether it's Instagram or TikTok or pictures of someone else, Facebook, it's not, you know what, too? It's not just social media. I think we often point to social media like, oh, you consume too much social media. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one thing. But sometimes it's our thoughts. Sometimes it's our rehearsed anxiety. It's our rehearsed trauma. Sometimes it's our rehearsed problems, our rehearsed offenses. Sometimes it's our hearkening back to things that used to be in the past. Sometimes it's our thoughts of looking back and saying, oh, I was hurt here and this happened to me and all this other stuff, which is not to negate the testimony, but that's what it is, a testimony, meaning it's not what you are dealing with in the present. So we don't have to rehearse it over and over and over again. We need to seek healing so that God can make us whole So we can move to be filled and not have issues that things are leaking out of us still. Filled for surplus. Filled with his power and his authority. Filled with vulnerability to be honest. To be real with God. To be real with God. To say, God, I need a filling. God, I need you to fill in those areas of me that are still leaking out pain and trauma and issues. God, I want to be filled. I want to be put in order. I want to be a kingdom recipient, a kingdom citizen. God, I want to know what it means to be healed fully. Filled and surplus. Filled and surplus. That's what God desires for us. That we're not just doing ministry the same old way. That we're not worshiping the same old. I want a new praise. I want a new song. I want new oil, new joy, new love, new depth. God, I want new. But you can't put old wine, the word says, in new wineskins. Or new wine, rather, in old wineskins. You can't mix the new and the old. The word says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. New. New. Not rehearsed. Not performing. New. That when we worship God, it will be a new fragrance in his nostrils. New. That when we sing a song, it will be a new song unto the Lord. New. Then when we pray, it will be a new prayer. Aren't you tired of praying the same old things? I'm tired of it. I want new. I want to see God do a new thing in our church, in our community. New. I'm tired of poverty and lack of education and lack of resources being a narrative of the South Bronx. I want new. I want it to be so much of a surplus that everyone's rushing to get here. And not kicking the residents out, but new, sustainable new. Turn with me to John 6 really quick. 
I got a few more, a few more minutes. New. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Put me in order. Put me in order. Yes. <laughs> John 6. So I mentioned earlier that feeding of the 5,000 is in every gospel. Every gospel. So when John records it, the reason why it's in every gospel, I don't know why it's in every gospel. That's, I actually don't know why. And I can say that confidently because I don't know the mind of God. I can assume that God is emphasizing the importance of this work, of this miraculous happening. And because it, res it, it reminds us of that shift between the disciples be being disciples to now being apostles. That there's a shift happening. In John's gospel, which I love the gospel of John, John is making a point with this feeding of the 5,000 that there are a multitude who are seeing this work happen and who are amazed by this work. They are amazed by this work so much so that after the feeding, they want more. So John 6, verse, let's start at verse 25. At this point, Jesus has gone away from Bethsaida. He's in a new place. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me. Not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. So he's talking about that physical filling. You're not seeking me because you want transformation. You're seeking me because you want something else. And sometimes that's a critique of our own pursuit of God. That sometimes in our deserted place, we decide that we want something happening now. And that's why we're pursuing God. And God's like, actually, I want to get to all of these other things that are before this, this deliverance you're looking for. I got some things I want to heal in you. I got some things I want to give you. I got some things I need to convict you on so that way you can pursue me. I have other things in store for you. Verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. This new food, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. That you believe in him whom he sent. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? That's the way that you work the work of God. That's the way that you do the work of God. You believe God. You believe his power. You believe his, his anointing. You believe his ability. You believe in his immutab immutability. You believe in his transcendence. You believe in his sovereignty. When you believe in God, then that changes your mindset about everything else. That when circumstances come up, you're like, I believe God. The doctor, doctor's report says one thing, I believe God. Situations at home with family, I believe God. Situations at work, I believe God. Situations with your spouse, I believe God. Situations with friends, I believe God. I believe God. The starting point is different for believers because our faith is in God and not in our circumstance. So we're not victims of our circumstance. We're not victims of having less or not having enough. We are victorious because we believe God. And God is greater than our circumstance. God is greater than our past mistakes. God is greater than what's in our bank account. God is greater than the bills on our table. God is greater than the doctor's report. God is greater than the medicine and the science. God is greater than the bill. God is greater than the paycheck. God is greater than the everything. God is greater than everything. That's how you do the work of God. You believe God. You trust God. You honor God. You worship God. That's why I was talking about that new praise and that new worship, because you're not starting from the same place. When you believe God, then a situation can come up and you're like, well, I've been through worse. But God was able to get me through the worst. And now I can worship God from a place that you can handle that and you can handle this. So, God, I worship you. God, I lift up your name over the circumstance. God, I, I worship you in the midst of the imposter syndrome and the questions of being, of being able to belong. God, I worship you because I believe you. I believe in your goodness. I believe 
in your love towards me. God loves us so much that he's willing to wait for us. He's willing to pursue us. He's willing to stay near us. He's willing to call out to us. God loves us. And all we have to do, Jesus says, is believe. Believe in Jesus. Believe in him whom he sent. All I have to do is believe that Jesus is the son of God. That's it. If I believe that, then everything else gets into order. Everything else gets into alignment. There's a beauty when you're in alignment with God. There's a safety in being, the, being in the will of God. There's a safety because it reminds me that God always has a hedge of protection around me. So when I step into a situation and I believe God and I believe his word and I believe what he says about me, I don't have to think about every detail in the situation. All I have to remind myself of is God. That's enough. We worry our, this is the trick of the enemy. We worry our minds to the point of exhaustion about things that aren't even real. That when it comes to knowing the reality and the truth of who God is, we, are, we don't even have the heart to receive it. How many people have stayed up late at night racking their brains about things that aren't even real? Y'all could be honest. Things that aren't even happening. The enemy will just pss, pss, pss. think about this. And what about this? And do you have this? And can you do? What if that happens? Oh, you put out the book. What if no one reads it? You launch the business. What if no one buys? You get the degree. What if you're in debt? You go out for the house. What if you aren't able to get the loan? It's all of these things. Haven't even stepped foot out to even do anything yet. And your mind is racked with pain and trauma and agony over things that aren't real. But God says, I am real. I'm realer than anything else that you're going through. I'm realer than any situation. I'm realer than any pain or trauma. I'm real. And I'm eternal. And I'm all powerful. And I'm sovereign. And I know you. I know the very number of hairs on your head. I am aware of you. I have experienced you. I'm fully in love with you. Nothing about you will deter my pursuit of you. All you have to do is believe. When those thoughts come up, those anxieties, I have to literally run to my word or run to someone that knows the word. Either or both. I need to be able to get to the truth of who God is quickly. Because when the enemy comes in, he doesn't come in to attack your house or to attack your children or attack your heart. He comes in for your mind. The reason why he comes for your mind, because when that's all disrupted, everything else is out of whack. And we just established back in Luke 9 that order is a divine kingdom principle. So when you're out of order in your mind, everything else is out of order in your life. But God is saying that if you get in line with my word, if you get in line with prayer, if you get in line with the church is putting forward, if you get in line with the truth of who I am, if you just believe, you can get in order. You can get filled to surplus. That things can change in your life if you just believe. Don't calculate. Don't make sense of. Don't comprehend. Just believe in him whom God sent. This same Jesus who died on the cross, who laid down his life. No one took his life from him. He laid down his life. This same Jesus got up three days later with all power and authority in his hand, sent the Holy Spirit down once he ascended up and gave it to you. You are not the victim of your circumstance. You are not what the enemy says that you are. You're not. You are who God says that you are. Get in order with what God says that you are, church. That's all you need to do. Believe him and believe his word.
Jesus goes on to say that he is the bread of life. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. I am the one that can fill hunger and thirst. I am the one that can fill in those empty parts of your body and those empty parts of your mind. I am he. He hearkens back to Moses giving the, being able to pray to God and, being able, and having God give manna daily to the Israelites. And they're like, are you greater than Moses? He's like, I'm the eternal bread. That was for a daily offering, that manna. It was good, but it was daily. I'm the one that lasts forever. Imagine having something that's so good that never expires. It never ends. Just when you think you've had enough. You know how when you're eating something and it's like the bottom of the bag and you didn't realize it was the bottom of the bag and so now your mind is like, oh God, it's the end. You understand? I hate that. Because it's just like, ah. But God is saying here, I'm never the bottom of the bag. I'm never the bottom of the bag. I always have more and more and more and more and more for you. I am the bread of life, he says. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I am the bread of life. I am that I am, God says. I am the bread of life. God doesn't want us hungry. He doesn't want us thirsty. He doesn't want us questioning and and put up in our minds with all these issues. God is saying, I am the bread of life, and I'm more than enough for you if you would only believe. Later on in chapter, in, in chapter 6 of John, he's rejected by those who were seeking after him at first in chapter 6. And he's rejected because he tells them that he's the bread that's come down from heaven. And that in order for them to have part with him, to be in communication or communion with him, that they need to be able to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. Now, this was highly offensive to the Jews because back in Leviticus, they were being told in the Levitical law that they weren't to touch anything with blood in it or eat of blood in an animal or any of those things. So to be told that they would have to consume flesh and consume blood, they thought that their law was greater than the one giving it. And God is reminding us here that even in the offense that God is not our own comprehension. He's not our own mindset. He's not our own whatever, that he's greater than that. So as people are turning away because they're offended by that, they're saying, how can I understand this? How can I do this thing? Jesus looks at the 12 at the end of chapter 6. And Jesus says, do you also want to go away? Have I offended you? And Simon Peter answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Is that anyone's declaration today? That I know who God is for me. I know that Jesus died on the cross for me. I know that he raised from the dead for me. I know that he is alive and seated at the right hand of the Father for me. I also know that he has the words of eternal life. Hallelujah. His word doesn't expire. It doesn't end. It doesn't stop. I remember back in a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, back in college, um, my mother-in-law sent out a text to a group of us, and she was like, an eternal God can never speak a temporary thing. And that stuck with me to this day because it reminded me that if God said it, it's going to happen. He doesn't have to give me the plans. He doesn't have to give me the the architecture of what's going to happen and how it's going to look. But if he said it, 
It's going to happen because he has the words of eternal life. He's aware of your circumstance. He's aware of your mistakes. He's aware of your needs and your wants and your plans. He's aware of everything about you, and he's spoken a word to you, and that word is an eternal word. It's not going to return unto him void, but it's a word that will last and stand forever. And I don't know about you, but I need a word that's going to stand and last forever. When the storms come and when the rain comes, I need a word word that says that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I need a word that says that I am more than victorious. I'm more than a conqueror. I need a word to remind me of who I am, the truth of who God says that I am. I need an eternal word. I need a filling word. I need a complete word. I don't need a nice thing. I don't need an encouragement. I don't need a pat on the back. I need the truth of who God says that I am, and I need a word that will convict me to get in order with the truth of who God says that I am. I need God. I need the truth of God. I need the love of God. I need the power of God. I need the anointing of God. I need the authority of God. I need God. Forget what the world has. Forget what the world's trying to offer. I need the power and plan of God. Because if I have that, that's going to outlast anything else. It's going to outlast my emotions. It's going to outlast who's going to be beside me or around me. It's going to outlast my friend group or my my house situation or my children's situation. It's going to outlast those storms. The eternal word of God lasts. It's real. It's truthful. It's honest. It's what we need. Are you willing to eat the word of God? Are you willing to be filled by the word of God? Are you willing to seek after the word of God? Are you willing to believe it for yourself? Are you willing to share it with someone else? We need to be in order and alignment so we can receive the word of God, that we can operate with the word of God, that we can move forward with the word of God, that we can speak the word of God, that everything about us will be founded on the word of God. But where can we we go. God has the eternal words of life. Will you receive the word of God today? For you, will you desire the word of God today? For you, the truth of who God says that you are. There's so much more in store for us, church. Will you receive it today? All you have to do is believe. Hallelujah.